I can't keep up with that anymore. I want you to take your Bible today real quickly. <clears throat> I'm going to have you out by noon tomorrow. <laughs> I'm just kidding you. Uh, since we have steak and potatoes on the way, and I asked mine to be medium rare, if I don't get bummed by 12, then it'll be medium done. So I'm going to have you out in time to have that steak back there for $5. I tell you, I'd do that even if I didn't want to watch those guys throw balls at one another. Can you think of anything more exciting on Sunday afternoon? I can't think of anything that'd be more fun. I'm not too sure it's exciting or not, all right? In the text, 1 Kings chapter 18, in the text, we have a spiritual and political conflict going on between not the Democrats and the Republicans and not between Trump and whoever, but between Ahab who has a testimony of being the worst king Israel ever had, led him into sin, and married a woman by the name of Jezebel. You can tell he's not too smart by doing that. And Elijah, the prophet of God, there is a tremendous conflict going on. It's always easy to point at areas that are not even close to the problem, like we are in America today. Problem's not what you see on television. The problem has been what you've been watching and what you have become by watching what you've allowed to be pumped into your living room. I say that not you specifically, I say you that in general. This country has changed. And it's not through changing unless there is a change, not at the White House, but at the church house. Our problem is not the White House in America. Our problem is the church house. Some have talked more about Trump this week than about Jesus. Uh, that's a bad deal if you're a Christian. And so there's a conflict going on. There's a drought in the land for three years and six months. It has not rained. And the conflict is coming to a head. Verse 17 of 1 Kings chapter 18. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, it's your fault. And if you watch Fox, it's somebody's fault. If you watch CNN and BULL, it's somebody else's fault. Is that not so? It's according to who you tuned into as to whose fault it is. And Ahab said, Thou art he that troubleth Israel. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but it's your fault. But thou and thy father's house, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and has followed Balaam, now therefore send and gather to me all Israel into Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered together the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. This conflict is coming to a head. 
850 false prophets to one. And Ahab sent all the children of Israel and gathered them to Mount Carmel. And Elijah said unto all the people, and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people were Baptist and said, Oh, me, what's coming now? Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 400 and 50, then let them give us two bullocks and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces. Now, Peter wouldn't like that one. And lay it on wood and put it on fire under it. Put no fire under it. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. And ye call, and call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth with fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is spoken, it is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, choose you one bullock for yourselves and dress it first. For your many and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. They took the bullet which was given them, and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, cry aloud, for he is a God, either he is talking or he is pursuing or he is in a journey or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and latchets till the blood gushed out upon them came to pass when midday was past and they prophesied under the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. And Elijah said unto all the people, come near unto me. And all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Verse 36, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell. Then the fire of the Lord fell. Our Father today, do it again. Lord, I pray today that you would be honored and glorified and that our attention be would directed toward thy word, thy will, and thy way. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Fire is in the Bible symbolic of our Lord. 
and his presence. At the burning of the bush, the Bible said that the bush burnt was not consumed. And it was there that God met Moses on the backside of the desert and did something in the heart of Moses that I think all of us need today. Set our soul on fire, Lord. Set our soul on fire. At Sinai, the Bible said, and the Lord descended upon the mount in fire. At Pentecost, the Bible said, there was setting upon the shoulders cloven tongues as a fire. John the Baptist said, when he has come, he would baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. I really believe we need to see the fire of God fall once again. I'm not so sure we want the fire of God, but I am sure we need the fire of God in our families, in our church, and in our nation. I think our homes could stand a little bit of heat from God. And here we see that Israel has a problem. And the problem, according to TV news in Israel, The problem is a drought. No rain for three years and six months. The problem is that there's grass, no grass for the animals. That's why Ahab sent Obaniah out to see if they could find any water, any grass, lest the mules and the horses all die. The news would say that the problem is uh, not idolatry, but the weather. And the weather has affected the economy. And the economy has has absolutely broken out in refugees going everywhere. So the problem we have here between the political and religious leaders of the day is really a drought. That's what everybody sees. That's what everybody feels. That's what everybody is so whooped up about. What we need is rain. It's messing with our economy. It's messing with our feel good kind of religion. But was the problem really the drought? Was the problem really political? If I read my Bible correctly, in verse 30, we have a problem that's not been on television. The altar had been broken down. You don't see much of that on television, do you? It's all about immigration and economy and little kids ripped from their parents and uh, so forth and so on. And uh, it's always uh, political. And, but really, I wonder what is America's problem today? I wonder maybe if we've not landed upon the real problem in your home, in your state, in your country, and in your church. It might be the altar 
has been forsaken. It might be we have this idea. We don't need God. We can handle this job all by ourselves. Well, well, what did I stumble upon today? <clears throat> Your problem's not emotionally. Your problem is not financial. Your problem is that you didn't, that you had too many kids. Now that's one problem. But the problem is we have forsaken the altar. Do you have an altar in your life? I wonder today if maybe there's not a reason <clears throat> for an altar. In the Bible, as you read the Bible, you'll see over and over the reference to altars. Altars in, in, in Jonah, the altars in Noah's day, the altars in Abraham's day, the altars in, in Moses' day, the altars in Joshua, the altars in Elijah's day, the altars, the altars. I wonder why there's so much emphasis on the altar in the Bible and so little emphasis on the altar today. You see, the altar speaks of worship. The altar speaks of worship. There is an innate, ingrained, built-in desire in the human heart to worship. Several years ago, we went to old Mexico. We were the second white folks or uh, Caucasian folks. You got to be careful today with, uh, you know, with uh, uh, political uh, correctness. Uh, folks had blue eyes and blonde hair. We were the second folk to go into the, to the Tolapaneca Indian tribe and there preach the gospel and see scores of those Indian folks back in the mountains get born again and saved and gloriously born again. And back there, way back in the mountains, I think we rode horses almost a day back into the mountains, second folk back in that area, and they had all kinds of false gods that they were worshiping the God of rain and the God of the uh, sun and the God of the moon and the stumps and everything else. In the world. They were worshiping idols. And I just wonder where all that came from. There is an innate desire in every heart to worship a God-shaped, cavern, a God-shaped vacuum, vacuum that only God can fill. Now some of you kids have substituted cell phone for God. Hey kids, when I do this, say amen. You didn't say amen. Let's do it again on three. One, two, three. I come over here, see if only you had your cell phones out. <laughs> but you're not the only ones that's traded God in for a cell phone. Let me find some more. Amen. But in here, God has placed a place in all of us for himself. And I don't care where you were born or what nationality you might be. There is that desire to worship. We have begun to worship at the, at, the, at the altar of materialism, drugs, alcohol, pleasure, you name it. But all of us are worshiping something. All of us has an altar where we bow each day. All of us has an altar. We get up and are going to spend our time in worship all day long. And the worship uh, altar speaks of worship. The altar speaks of sacrifice. 
The altar speaks of giving. The altar speaks of fellowship. And that's what the altar's all about. And I believe the problem in our land today and in our church and in most of our homes is the altar needs repair. We need altars in our life. Notice God did not come till the altar was repaired. Fire did not fall till the altar was repaired. Well, if God would just do this, I'll do this. No, God says you do this and then fire will fall. God says when you do this, then I'll send revival. When you do this, I'll start answering prayer. When you do this, I will be at your attention. I think there's some altars that we need to repair. Could I give you one? I got 15 minutes. Can I give you one in 15 minutes? If you'll listen real fast, I'll give you three in 15 minutes. Know how to listen fast? Watch this. I believe we need to repair the altar of preaching. Preaching. I don't like preaching. No, but you need preaching. You said, I like teaching, but you need preaching. Now, there's no difference in preaching and teaching. Yes, there is. Look at a dictionary and see if they're on the same page. There's a difference between preaching and teaching. And I think we need in our land, in America, I like what was said. You know, uh, I like the guy at First Baptist in Dallas. Uh, Did you see that, that, that billboard they put up in Dallas? America is a Christian nation. They put two of them up. And the mayor of Dallas and one of the papers in Dallas did not think they were right and had them taken down. And so the billboard company gave in to pressure, political correctness, and they took down the two billboards that said, America is a Christian nation. Made Jeffers so mad that he put up 22 more. Thank God for somebody that's got a backbone like a railroad tie and a heart as big as a watermelon. That don't give in and don't give up and don't sell out to everything in the world. Amen. Amen. We need to rebuild the altar in America and in our church of preaching. Listen to me. Preaching. Now, a preacher is a lot better preacher when he's preaching to people and not pews. Did you hear me? You need preaching. You say, "I no, I don't. That's proof you need preaching. Well, I don't like anybody yelling at me. But some of you need yelled at. And most of you, I'd have to yell real loud tonight to get you to hear me. Because the geographical locations will not be the same. We need to rebuild the altars of preaching. I mean old-fashioned preaching. I'm talking about exciting kind of preaching. I'm talking about the kind that would cause a guy to break a rib while he's preaching and go blind while he's preaching, pass out while he's preaching. At least some of you folk might say, dear God, something's happening. Amen. I've seen more enthusiasm at an opening of an umbrella than I do in the average Baptist church. Can you say amen? Well, I'm just sitting here being taught just 
eating up all the gravy and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and you're gonna go outside and up, chuck it, and come back next week. What are you doing with the preaching? We need to renew the altar of preaching, repair the altar by attending the preaching. You think about it now, uh, you need to attend all the services with all the family and bring your friend because preaching is the food for the soul. Preaching, bless your heart, is the medicine for the soul. Preaching, bless your heart, is the counsel for the soul. And what's wrong with our churches is we see in the book of Genesis chapter two and verse seven, and the Bible said, and out of the dust of the earth, God created man and he's laying there. He looks alive. He looks all right. Yes, he's gonna do all right. He just ain't got no life in him. Then God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living body? Nay. A living spirit? Nay. A living soul. There he lay, all his potential. There he lay, yes he is, that bird's going to name, whoop, had a blowout. <laughs> well, now I know why they put them pockets in the shirts. <laughs> now I'll be walking lopsided all day long because my shoulder will be on the floor all day long. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> oh, me. <laughs> It's a private joke. <laughs> there he lay. All the potential. There it lay. No life. There it lays. Talent and abilities. There it lay. The breath of God is gone. The soul is empty. The soul don't need feeding or medicine. No, we're okay. Just leave us laying here. Well, I don't need to go to church tonight. I don't need preaching. There Adam lay. Look how pretty he is. Yeah. Adam's so pretty laying there dead, dry, useless until God did something. Are you listening? Our problem is not in Washington. Our problem is right here in these pews. Our problem is us. Problem in America is there are too many us's like us laying Silent, if you please. Comfortable, if you please. Satisfied, if you please. Empty of God and satisfied. Maybe we need to repair the altar of preaching. Amen? Well, I tell you, I just get bored with preaching. How long do you watch television? Repair the altar by attendance. Repair the altar by giving your attention. Listen. Whatever you listen to besides the preaching, turn it off and tune it into the preaching. Listen to the preaching on purpose. Listen to the preaching and consider what is said. 
listen to the preaching and pass it down to your kids. Well, I've made somebody mad. Can you imagine me doing that on Sunday morning? I should have waited till Sunday night to do that since I don't preach. See, our problem, our problem is not immigration. Now, you'll hear more of that, about that this week than you will about the altars. Our problem is not the GOP or the BULL or the Democrats. The problem with us is the altar has been broken down at the house and at the church and at the workplace. And when the altar's down, no life. And the devil has a heyday. Come on now. Hmm? Oh, we need the preaching because it's, it's medicine, it's health, and I, I'm done. Uh, this is a one point of a five-point message, and I got two minutes. But I think I've said enough for you to get to drift. How's the altar at your house? You said, we're good people, but are you godly people? So we don't watch smut at our house. That's good. But it takes more than good to be godly. Amen. Amen. Come on now. And I'm not talking about good. I'm talking about godly. Our kids need to see godly parents. Our visitors need to see godly Christians. Bless your heart. We need to repair the altar by attending the services. You say, well, I don't like the services. I don't either, but it's healthy. Did your mama ever make you eat peas? I'm talking about English peas. Them green slimy kind. And what do they call that corn? They blow the corn up. Uh, hominy. Boiled okra. One good thing about eating boiled okra, once you get it started, you don't get it stopped. <laughs> kind of like sucking an egg, amen? You ever tried that? It'll do, it'll do great. It makes you spiritual. Sucking raw eggs, it really does. Give, repair the altar through attendance and through attention and through our attitude. The Bible said, Grieve not the Spirit, Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. But put away from yourself all bitterness and wrath and evil speaking and clamor. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven us. Oh, if we'd put that altar of preaching back up when our soul needs medicine, it would be delivered from the pulpit of God. And when our soul needs encouraging, and our soul needs food, we'd get it here. Israel's problem was not the drought. Israel's problem was the altars. The altar needed to be repaired. And all of God's people said. Amen. I picked up something this morning. I, I just like to read it to you and I'm done, honest. It's, that clock is straight up and down, 12 o'clock, is it not? It says, in the mouth of two witnesses, it's true. 12 o'clock. Listen to this. Hardcore commitment. This was taken from a note found on the desk of an African martyr. He had written this just before they killed him and 
taken his life. He said, I am of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of his. I won't look back, let down, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking, smooth knees, colorless dreams, teen visions, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarf goals. I am no longer, I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, or praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on his promise, walk by his patience, and uplifted by prayer, and I labor with power. My face is set. My gait is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions are few. My guide is reliable. My mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, or turned back. God, give us that kind of Christians. God, give every wife in this place that kind of husband. And God, give every husband in this place that kind of wife. And for our kids' sake, give all of our kids that kind of parents. Let's go home 